Located in the far west of Wiltshire, close to the border with Somerset, lies the small town of Westbury. Nestled under the northwestern flank of Salisbury Plain, this former mill town still retains many of its old buildings, including those formerly associated with the cloth industry. Featured in the Doomsday Book, Westbury is home to the oldest of Wiltshire's white horses and the town's most famous feature, the Westbury White Horse. Thought to be over 300 years old, its location on the side of a steep hill means that it can be seen from many miles away. At the start of the Great War, the population of Westbury and surrounding villages was approximately 3,500. As the new recruits from Westbury marched off to war, another group of young men arrived in the town, the officers and soldiers of the Army Service Corps. Approximately 300 were stationed in the town and many public buildings were put at their disposal, including the Laverton, which became their mess hall. Because of the mainline railway station, Westbury's role for the remainder of the war was as a transit point for soldiers arriving and moving to camps on Salisbury Plain. When peace finally came on November the 11th, 1918, Westbury had lost approximately 130 local men. Although only 92 are remembered in the town's Book of Remembrance and on the war memorials. Here are some of their stories. Charles Hannaford served in the Royal Engineers during the Great War. On his return, he worked on the railways, which he did until his retirement. His son still lives in Westbury. He joined the Territory Army in about 1913-1914 as a boy, boy soldier, and he was immediately uh, stationed to the Breakwater Fort in Weymouth, which is a fort which is on the breakwater between Portland Harbour and, and Weymouth. There he spent his 17th birthday and I do, do know that his parents, who lived in Weymouth, came down to Weymouth in the hope of waving across the water to uh, maybe see him on his, on his birthday. But of course, that, that never did happen. He, he, they didn't see him. Herbert Frederick Curley, known as Fred, was born near Salisbury. As a young man, he drove the Royal Mail coach from Salisbury to Bath, stopping to change horses at the Bath Arms in Warminster, which was where he met Florence Gilbert, who was in service there. The couple married in 1912. After the marriage, Fred became a gardener for a local vicar. When the rector moved to Westbury, Fred and Florence moved with him, and Fred became a bell ringer at All Saints Church. The couple's son, Gilbert, was born in August 1913. As World War I loomed, Fred joined the 1st Battalion, the Somerset Light Infantry, enlisting at Bristol. The battalion sailed from Southampton on the 22nd of August and arrived in Le Havre that evening. Early on the morning of the 26th, two companies of the Somersets took position there with the 1st Rifle Brigade on their right and the 1st East Lancashires to their left. Heavy German artillery fire landed on the quarry position and German infantry and machine guns moved into the village of fontaine au -Pierre, also opening fire on the position, which was unentrenched. The battalion were now under intense artillery and machine gun fire, and despite accurate rifle fire from the Somersets, the Germans continued to advance, with Fred's battalion suffering heavy casualties as a result of the artillery fire. Shortly after, the Germans attacked again but twice they were thrown back and despite very heavy fighting, the village remained in British hands. Final casualties for the day were found to be 280 men. Amongst them was Fred Curley, who was tragically killed only four days after arriving in France. A great tribute to the Somersets and to Fred comes from a German officer who wrote of this action, I did not think it possible that flesh and blood could survive such a great onslaught. Our men attacked with the utmost determination, but again and again they were driven back by those incomparable soldiers. For the first year following the battle, Fred was reported wounded and missing. A year later, his wife Florence received the news from the War Office that he had indeed been killed on the 26th of August, 1914. Fred's body was never recovered, so he has no known grave. However, he is recorded on the Westbury War Memorial and remembered on a plaque 
that hangs in the bell tower of All Saints Church, which reads, to the memory of H. Fred Curley, a ringer of this tower who was killed in the European War, 1914 to 1919. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And it was only when Helen did the painting that I really, you know, got closer to him, really, and because of the 100th anniversary of his death. And also, like, Helen wasn't going to put the church tower in the, in the painting, but I had a dream one night and said about the church, you should, should really put the church tower in, because he was a bell ringer and put the light on. So, so, she, so she did it. She put that in after. William Ewart Ernie was born in 1888 in Trowbridge and was the eighth of 11 children. And there, we have quite a lot of paperwork and letters, uh, that certainly some lovely letters that were written by him to the family in, in Trowbridge. And one of the striking things I always think about that is that he, he always was more worried in his letters about their health, how they were, how they were living, how they were getting on, were, did they have enough money, than, than what was happening to him. Strangely enough, we've, uh, the history said that he enlisted with the 5th Wilts uh, Regiment under uh, Kitchener when he put out his famous uh, England Wants You. He went off to war and we thought this is what had happened. But then um, we found an old photograph from 1901 from Peshawar in um, India, as it was then, um, and we couldn't marry up how he was in India uh, with the army, but at the same time, so-called back here years later, enlisting. So it's something we're now trying to investigate via the Wiltshire Regiment. Harry Pynchon was born at Whittington, near Uphaven, on the 12th of March, 1890. Harry lied about his age to join the army in 1906, declaring that he had been born in 1887. That would have made him 18 when he enlisted, but he was actually only 15 years and 10 months old. Harry was discharged from the army, having completed 24 years service. His discharge certificate records his character as very good, honest, sober, steady and hardworking. His son Les still lives in Westbury. A lovely father, couldn't have wished for any better. All men were tough little nuts. They were good. But you could rely on them. Every one, every last one you could rely on. Wonderful sort of chaps. Not like today. As far as I can, I can remember, he was a railwayman. He was a, what they call a ganger. And these were a group of men who used to look after the, what they call the permanent way. In other words, they looked after the rails and the wooden blocks they used to keep the rails tight. It uh, brought back some lovely memories of Dad when he was in the fire brigade. I didn't know him, of course, when he was in the army. People didn't used to talk about it. People never used to talk about the war. I had quite a hard job to get him to say anything. He once told my niece, I believe, he told her of the time when a horse got killed and he cried for three, for three days because he loved this horse, as they all did. Men were very strong, very tough, but if they loved something, it died with them. I went to work in the swimming pool in 1976. Then it was what they call the old pool. All the baths are gone, the slipper baths down in the side. But I used to have a small little office, cashier office. And right opposite that office was the ladies' changing room. Well, we'd heard, you know, rumours and my mum saying about different things going on at the pool. Anyway, I was sat in there one day and I, the door was open and I'd done some writing for Fred, who was the manager at the time, and I looked up and I thought, oh, 
And there was this person stood there. Well, I say person from the waist up. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm seeing things. Don't be silly, Mags. And I put my head down and done something, looked up again, and he was still there. And I thought, I know you. And he smiled, and the smile did it. It was my granddad. Edgar was my mother's brother, and he obviously uh, went in it in 1914. But he was uh, gassed and suffered from shell shock very, very badly. And in fact, in those days, they went to a lunatic asylum because they were, they'd be throwing his arms about. He never had any peace whatsoever. He couldn't go three minutes without something moving. He always had a bad chest, shall we say. Um, and the bleeding from his ear, ears from the guns. Um, he was never a well man. A few years later, not many, but I was <laughs> when I was 15, um, his son uh, got him out of the hospital. And then, for some reason, he left to move up into Kent. And my uncle Eddie, he didn't want to go. He wanted to stay in Westbury. So he came to live with us, my family. We only had a two bedroom cottage in Westbury. I don't, they, they split one room in half. And I was sleeping with Ed, Uncle Ed. But he, not only was he jumping about all day, but all night as well. He, every five minutes he'd be sit up straight and throw his clothes back. And uh, of course I was, uh, I think I was about 15, 16. No, I was still at school. Um, and I couldn't get any sleep. So it, finished, it ended up him staying with my mother and me moving out to my grandmother's. But he he suffered badly. He, he was as good as gold, he, you know. I remember being called home from work when he died. That's him. It's, I never saw him in the uniform, of course, of course, but that, that is him. But I, because I knew him when he was so ill, I could have cried, I could have cried a baby. My brother probably might now. Yes, I, I, she got him just right. I'm Helen Chester. Um, I'm a portrait artist and I've been working on the series of portraits, The Everyday Tommy, which is about uh, the people of Westbury whose lives were affected or taken by the First World War. There was a thing in the newspaper from um, a military historian called Andrew Field and he wanted families to come forward who had relatives whose names were on the war memorial, memorial in Westbury. Um, and my great grandfather was on there, um, Herbert Frederick Curley. Um, I, re I realised that um, having worked in, in a fine art previously um, and in galleries that people of um, sort of working class families only had black and white photographs of their relatives. Um, the wealthy families were able to commission portraits and um, that the, there was no there was no record of my great-grandfather. And I realised there were other families in Westbury who were in a similar position. And so I asked um, uh, people to come forward. I did use some of them that Andrew had already researched. And um, it kind of went from there and it snowballed. <laughs> 